When you realize you get to preach on Father's Day, it can be a little intimidating, right? Because who is the guy up at the pulpit and what's he got to say to fathers and what's he got to say about all these things? It just happens to be that I start us out this morning on 1 Peter chapter 3, which talks about husbands and wives. So don't shoot the messenger. I'm just saying, don't shoot the messenger. But Peter has been communicating the importance of submission to this point. He talked about how Christians should, should submit to the authorities that are placed in front of us and above us by God, specifically to help themselves. Because as we submit, not only are we benefiting ourselves, but we're benefiting the kingdom. It gives us the opportunity to witness. We don't become a target. Christianity isn't going to be viewed as something that needs to be put down and destroyed, even though that's the world's tendency toward it anyway. Because when you speak truth to people, it's not always fun, is it? You try to speak the truth in love and you try to speak the truth in a gentle way, but sometimes that doesn't always come across that way. Just like, so some of you have heard my stories growing up. Um, my dad was a real busy businessman, so we spent a lot of time with my grandparents. And my grandfather spoke the truth in a very direct way. Um, he, he grew up on a farm. He was an airplane mechanic for a long time. Then he went back and got a farm again uh, because he enjoyed that so much. And when you're working on the farm, we were sharing some stories about hay, baling hay, working with hay. You guys have heard me talk about tomatoes and about strawberries and all that stuff. He was a no-nonsense guy, and he wanted to get it done as quick as possible, so he would be direct and to the point. So if you were being dumb, he would tell you you're being dumb. If you were doing it wrong, he would tell you you're doing it wrong. He would even tell me when I wasn't doing it right enough. <laughs> right? You, you know what I'm talking about. Well, that's okay, but there's a better way to do it, so you need to do it this way. But the person that I look to when I look back and I look at my example, my father wasn't a believer. He wasn't a Christian. So I didn't have any guidance when it came to faith or to any of those things. And he struggled with family. My dad was married and divorced three times. And so he was searching himself. But my grandfather was the rock of the family. He was the one that we looked forward to going and spending time with and seeing because we always knew by the way that he lived that he loved us and he wanted what was best for us because we saw the example of it in his life. So this morning as I share from this passage in 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 1 through 7, I want us to understand that Peter is telling us these things so that we can live as examples because I can tell you the, way, the Christian man I am today standing up here is because I had godly examples around me to mentor me and disciple, three, disciple me through my walk. I had godly disciples, uh, I had godly men in front of me when I received Christ that helped d disciple me and guide me. I had a godly man in college that helped disciple me and guide me. I have had godly men throughout my father-in-law is a godly man who has given me an example and helped me see what it means to be a godly man and to live out my life for God. And so as we look at these things and we try to understand these things, remember, Peter is saying this to us so that we can be that example to the family we live in and to the people around us. So look with me. Wives, we start out with you, but we'll get to the guys really quick. All right? So starting in verse 1, 1 Peter chapter 3, it says, Wives, in the same way, submit to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. When they see the purity and reverence in your lives, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair and wearing, wearing gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should be the inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet, quiet spirit, which is, the, is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy woman, women of the past have put their hope in God used to make themselves beautiful. 
They were submissive to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her master. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. And so Peter starts out by saying, ladies, you need to be a witness and example in the way that you live. And part of this witness is living a life of submission to your husbands. Now, this is, we don't like that word. Remember a couple weeks ago when I was preaching a submission, I said, I don't like preaching this because I don't like that word. We don't like submission because we don't understand it. Our society has taken it and made it into something it was never meant to be. Do you understand that unless you choose to submit, you're not submitting? Unless it is a voluntary choice by you to submit, because we are called to submit to God in all things, right? We submit to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Submission is part of who we are in our faith. And we are supposed to be examples in that in, the, in circum, cer, uh, certain circumstances as we live our lives for Christ. Submission is part of that. And just, just the definition I love, it says submission means to voluntary, voluntarily take a position where you put trust in someone else and heed their leadership. Submission is not slavery, coercion, Manipulation, intimidation, misguidance, or suppression. It is a willing choice to trust someone else. We are called to submit in all things to Christ. Ladies, this specific example talks about being submissive so that a husband that does not know Christ will come to know him by your witness and example. By the way you live your lives. It doesn't mean you don't have a say. It doesn't mean that you don't get to be part of the discussion. It means that you are willing to trust that person that you're married to. Just like we say we're willing to trust Christ and follow him. You are saying, I am willing to trust you and follow you to your husband. And so... What are the results of this submission? Well, look at the first one. It's found in verse 1. It is to be a witness to an unbelieving person, an unbelieving husband. We are called to be witnesses in all things, correct? Part of that is our submission to Christ. Part of it is our submission to authorities. Part of it is our submission to our spouses. Because husbands will submit to their wives in certain things as well. It is not a one-way street. It happens both ways. But here's the way the world does it. Think about it. Does the world want us to submit to authority? Yeah. Okay. Does the wor world want us to submit to our bosses and to our businesses? Yep. yep. <laughs> There's a big yelp right there. Okay. Does the wor world want us to submit to police and to other kind of law enforcement agencies? Sure. They do. So the world doesn't mind if we submit to the things they can use to control us. But how about, does the world want us to submit to God? They don't care as long as it doesn't directly affect them, right? Okay? Does the world want us to submit to our spouse, to our husband, to our wives? Not usually. They tell you, you're a strong, independent person. You may need to make all your decisions based on what you want and how you want to live. Ever heard that before? I mean, that's the majority of the way that our world tries to advertise to people, right? You deserve this. You need this. You want this. You should have this. And then once you get it, you think everything in your life is going to be awesome and great. And you get it. And what do you say? Wait, there's a new one. And that one's even better. So I have to have that one now. When I got my, my wife got me an Xbox when they first came out. And to tell you how old I am, I still have it. I, th I figured eventually it would be worth some money because it would come back around, right? And there's some games I still like to play on it. And all the, all the students that have come to my house and all the people I talk to go, those graphics are horrible. I said, yeah, but it's the very first one. And then another Xbox came out. And then another Xbox came out. So when the next one came out, I got the next one, right? Because it could still play the games from the first one, so I got the next one. It's all good. 
Then the next one came out, and Kathy's like, do you want the next one? I go, no, I don't want the next one. Why? I've already got these. And by the time it's all said and done, there have been five generations of Xbox. Now, I, now I will have to admit I have Gen 4 too. So I have Gen 1, Gen 2, and Gen 4. I don't have Gen 5. And some of you are like, who cares? <laughs> I get it. But that's the thing that our world does is they try to make you care about the things that really are irrelevant, right? They want to have control over your money. They want to have control over your time. And they want to have control over your family if they can. God says, follow me. I want to give you what you really need. I want to minister to you and to your family. I want to give you blessings. The world's like, what can you give me? And so when we look at these things and we get confused and we get frustrated about all this stuff, what we need to remember is who is it that is telling us these things? And what is their motivation? God's motivation for us is that he wants to give us great gifts. He wants to bless our lives. Right? And so as we look at this principle, the first thing is she, she's living a life that is a witness to her, to her unbelieving husband. Second point is found in verse 2 that he's trying to make. It produces purity and reverence. As you live this life honoring God and, and submitting to your husband, what it produces is this purity and reverence that people can't understand because you're putting others, you're putting your husband in front of yourself, you're putting your children in front of yourself, and you're putting Christ on his throne in front of yourself. And so there's this change in you. There's this change in us as we take those steps and we do those things. And what happens is found in verse three, verses 3 and 4, this inner godly beauty develops. And in that, you see a gentle, quiet spirit and beauty. Do you understand what I'm talking about when I say that? Have you ever looked at someone and just seen the peace that passes all understanding of God dwelling in them and go, wow, okay. What do I, where does that come from? How do you get to that point? I, I, I overheard now, understand this about me, and my, it drives my wife crazy sometimes. I can listen to three or four conversations going on at once. So you're in trouble. No. So I can be having an interaction with somebody and I can hear this conversation and this conversation and that conversation going on at the same time. And every once in a while, Kathy will look at me and go, are you listening to them? And I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry. And I, I overheard this conversation one Sunday morning and there was this younger lady talking to this older lady, and I'm not going to call names or anything like that because, yeah, no. Because um, I don't want you to know who I think is older and younger and all those things. But anyway, um, I was listening to this conversation going on. And this, this, this older lady is trying to help mentor this younger lady. She's like, my children are driving me crazy. I don't have time to do anything. And... You know, I'm, I'm, my house is a mess and I can't, I can't, you know, I'm working part time and I'm doing all the, and she's, she's just pouring out her frustration to this older lady. And her first response was, let me pray with you. And let me pray for you. And then after they pray, they did a quick prayer right there. She started saying, what can I do to help you? And it was an amazing interaction that I was eavesdropping on while it was going on. And I'm thinking, that is the way the church needs to respond to help each other in those kind of situations. Ladies, pass on this pure purity and reverence and this inner beauty with this quiet spirit to others so that they understand it. And as they see it, they will desire to know what it's about. And that is the witness to not only their husbands that Peter is talking about here, but to the whole world around them. Because when you see something different like that, it draws your attention, doesn't it? You look at it and you go, wow, okay. I wasn't expecting that. 
And that is something that's interesting. And I can sense God in that and that, and, and that peace. And I just don't fully get it because I don't have that in my life. So you start looking at that going, hmm, how can I do that? How can I get that? That's the thing that draws you to Christ, isn't it? You see that, that love and that compassion and that sweet spirit that you don't understand, and it draws you in, and it, it gets your attention. And you're like, I desire that because the world doesn't give that to me. The world does not give that to me. All it gives me is confusion and makes me tired and wants everything I'm willing to give it with not much back. And so it's one of those situations where you go, okay, all right, how do I get there? And Paul says, as we submit to God, we need to submit to others. As we do those things, we get this peace that passes understanding that indwells our lives and our heart, and we become what God wants us to be in that, in that time as we do those things. And so Peter is addressing all this in verses 1 through 6. Then he gets to verse 7. And when he gets to verse 7, guys, this is where you come in. Husbands, in the same way, be consider, considerate as you live life with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with their gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. So he calls us husbands to give our wives respect. And not only that, but to be considerate of them and consider the fact that they're heirs with you for this gracious gift of life that, that God has given us. It also says that we need to be careful that we treat them in the proper way so it does not hinder our prayers. If we do not treat them in the right way, guys, with the respect we're supposed to, uh, yeah, I, I did the whole who's your daddy thing and you treat others like your dad. My, my grandfather, one of the things is he always would say is you need to show other people the proper respect. Always show people the proper respect. And so when Peter is talking about the respect here, he's saying show your wife the proper respect because of how she lives her life. Show your wife the proper respect because it will impact your life if you don't. And so from this, you sit there and you ask, Paul talks about it in Ephesians 5 where he also says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. As we live a life where we give ourselves up for our wives, can you give yourself up for your wives and love them truly if you don't respect them, men? I can tell you, guys will not do anything close to their best for someone they don't respect. Am I right, gentlemen? Okay. We will go through the motions, but unless we respect that person, we will not give them the do their, we, we will not give them our best unless we respect them. And in that, what we need to understand is we do not give our wives our best unless we show them respect and we respect them truly. And so this is where it becomes about us. This is where it becomes about us living the way we need to. And what I want to do is when I was sitting and I was praying about this passage and I was thinking through all these things, I was, I, in order for our wives to be able to submit to us the way they need to, guys, we need to be the godly man that they can submit to. Do you live the kind of life for Christ that makes it easy for your wife to submit to you and your children to submit to you? Are you that example that they need, that they see in spiritual things so that they look at you and go, it's easy for me to submit to him because of the way he lives his life before me, because he lives for Christ, because he does the things he's asked to do. And so how do we get to that point? How do we become that godly leader, that godly man that we need to be in order to lead our family and to mentor our kids 
and to respect our wives and to do the things we are called to do in Christ. How do we become that, that person? Um, do any of you remember Promise Keepers? Anybody remember the Promise Keepers? Promise Keepers was this movement. Church, They need to step up. They need to be the spiritual leaders. They need to take control of their lives in the way God has called them to do it. It was a big movement a while back, and it's still around. It's just not as big a movement as it used to be. It's not as straightforward and powerful as it used to be. But some of these principles come from promise keepers. Some of these principles just come from scripts. They're all straight from scripture, but some of them are laid out by Peter. Some of them are laid out by Paul. And some of them are, are drawn in with promise keepers. And I wanted to go over these seven points with you. Now, just because I have up there godly leader slash man doesn't mean these don't apply to you ladies as well. Because ladies, you need to have these same principles and characters in your life. So first of all, the first point I'm, that I have here that I want to point, point you to is first you need to be a servant. Matthew 23, 7, uh, 11 says, the greatest among you will be your servant. Who do you serve? Our, my first question to you, the first step, who do you serve? Are you a servant of Christ? And are you willing to serve others in his name? Because Jesus himself said in Matthew 23, 11, the greatest among you will be your servant. And if you say, yeah, I'm willing to be a servant. Yeah, I'm willing to serve. Where do you serve? And how do you serve? That's what you need to ask yourself. Because all of us should be serving Christ in some way, shape, or form. And we should be serving Christ not only in the church, but outside the church. So where do you serve? Ask yourself this morning, if you're a servant, where you're serving. Second point, you need to be teachable. Now, that doesn't mean that you're just willing to sit down and read a Bible or be in a Bible study. Teachable means you're willing to learn. You're willing to receive what's being taught. Um, my grandfather used to say of me when I was younger, the easiest way to teach me was to ride it on a two by four and then hit me in the head with it. Th that was the quickest, easiest way to teach me something. Now, hopefully I'm not as bad as I used to be because that was painful. But anyway, Proverbs 19.20 uh, says, listen to advice, accept instruction, and in the end, you will be wise. We need to be teachable. And it doesn't stop when your kids leave the nest, okay? It doesn't stop when your kids have kids. It never stops. If we are to conform to the image of Christ, that means we must be teachable all of our lives so that we become more and more like him. That is the goal of an active Christian, right? To become more like Christ. And in order for us to become more like Christ, we are being conformed to his image continually. And that's what we need to understand as teachable. Number three, filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts 6, 3, brothers, Choose the men among from whom uh, from choose the men from among you who are known to be full of spirit and in wisdom. We need to look toward the Holy Spirit and be filled with the Holy Spirit as we live life and minister. He is the counselor. He is the one that can help guide and direct our path. And so this the spirit needs to be part of the choices and decisions we make. And the Spirit needs to be involved in our lives as we, move, as we live and as we try to serve Christ, our family, and others. Um, we need to be enthusiastic about the role. Ephesians 6-7 says, serve wholeheartedly as if you're serving the Lord, not men. And so be enthusiastic about this role that God gives you. Men, be enthusiastic about being a husband and a father. Leaders, be enthusiastic about what you're leading and serving in. Don't do it just because no one else will do it. Don't do it because you feel like it's being forced on you. <clears throat> Be enthusiastic about it. Accept the challenge and give yourself to that challenge. Move and serve God in a way that honors him and those that you are serving as well. Uh, be a model of humility and forgiveness. 
Uh, 1 Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Then you have Ephesians 4, 32. It says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. In Christ God forgave you. And so we have these models of humility and forgiveness that we need to understand. The worst thing you can do is not model true forgiveness and true humility in front of people. Because if you're unwilling to model that, why should you be willing to expect that from other people? If you want other people to be humble, they need to be able to see the humility in you. If you want to receive forgiveness, and so understand all these principles work together to help us become who God wants us to be. And in that, we lead others to becoming more like Christ. So love those, you, uh, love those loving those he leads. I wrote that a little weird. Loving those he leads. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? For even the tax collectors do that. And in John 13, 34 through 35, he says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, you must also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So we need to love those we lead. <clears throat> and when it, we're talking about love, I am not talking about the world's view of love. I am, working, I am talking about Christ's view of love, that sacrificial, giving type of love that the world doesn't fully understand. And so as we talk about loving others or the ones we lead, we love them like Christ loves them. And then the last one says, ready to admit weaknesses in areas where he needs growth or where we need growth. <clears throat> we need to be willing to be transparent in front of others so they can see us the way God sees us. We need to be honest. We need to be transparent. If you have a weakness, share that weakness so others can help you from that, in that weakness. I know it's hard because what the world looks to do is as soon as, as soon as you show that weakness, what does the world do? It tries to attack it. But if you have a weakness, don't count it as a problem. Count it as an opportunity for God to use it in your life. And point out those areas where you know you are not fully grown. Point out those areas where you know God is still working on you and share that with other people. Let them know where you stand in Christ. I am not perfected yet. I am not perfect. My grandchildren may think I'm perfect. Y'all didn't catch that, did you? Okay. Because I give them donuts and cookies. No. Um, I am not perfect, and I am not complete. I am a work in progress, and I understand that. And those of you that know me well know that. And it, the reason that you know that is because I admit my weaknesses, and I share areas that I still need to grow in, and some of you point those out to me continually. Um, but I appreciate it because I know it comes from love, right? Right? None of us are perfect. None, none of us are all the end all be all. The reason the church is the body of Christ, a group of believers working together to accomplish that thing is because we all bring different abilities, skills together to the church to meet the need of the body, to complete the body. And as we come together to complete the body, it becomes what God intended it to be. And so as we do that, we need to admit our, weak, our weaknesses and the areas where we need to grow and look for those opportunities as we do all that together. And so we need to be a servant, be teachable, filled with the Holy Spirit, enthusiastic about the role we've been given, a model of humility and forgiveness, loving to those we lead, ready to admit weakness and areas where we need to grow. If you had a leader with those characteristics, how would you feel? Would you, be, would you be happy? Would you like that? Is that someone you can follow? 
Those are the things we need to understand. Men, as you lead in your family, if you live like this, God will honor that, and so will your family. Ladies, as you raise your children, as you mentor other women, if you lead like this, this is something they will appreciate, and that will, they'll honor that, and they'll honor you. As we think about different things we can do, do you think if we live like that, that God will be happy with us? Do you think we honor him in that? Absolutely we do. And so my challenge to you this morning is don't worry about what the world thinks. Don't worry about if the world understands because if you can live like this, if you can be this witness to the world around you, they will see Christ in you. We were studying in Acts this morning, and one of the interesting things that we were looking at, because we were, we were talking about baptizing 3,000 people, and we were also talking about the fact that those people were coming together, and they were fellowshipping together, and they were eating meals together, and they were studying the world to, word together, and they were joining together in prayer. And because they were taking those steps, because they were doing those things, to become closer to God and closer to each other and to build the church. You know what the result was? Those of you that were in class should know. What was the result of all that? It says they, can, they, they did what? Added to their numbers daily. When we live for Christ, when we follow these principles... When we do the things that God calls us to do, submission, respect, all those different things, what it does is it draws the attention of the world to Jesus. And then we have the opportunity to say, I can tell you why I live like this. I can tell you why I do these things. I can tell you why I have this joy in my life. It's because I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and he dwells within my heart. And he can do that for you as well. That's what it's all about, is trying to lead other people to Christ. And we do it through how we live our own lives. One of the things that frustrates me the most, and one of the, you know, other than getting in the head, hitting the head with a two-by-four so that I remember things, um, is when someone tells me to do something they're not willing to do themselves. Anyone have a problem with that? No one? Just me. Okay, I get it. Just stubborn like that. I am willing to respect and follow somebody who's willing to do it or has done it themselves. But if they're asking me to do something they're unwilling to do themselves and they've never done themselves I have a real hard time following that. And I just think that's who we are. I think that's how we wired. we're wired. And that's why Jesus came. And so this morning, if, if you've never met Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you don't know him, this could be the morning that you get to know him. So if you, want, if you wonder about this Jesus I'm talking about, if you want to know how to receive him as your Lord and Savior, if you want to become a Christian, ask him into your heart. If you want any of those things, please come down and talk to me as we have the time of invitation. Because that way, that way, even if you don't choose him this morning, I can tell you about my Savior. And I can tell you about all those things that I was talking about on the screen which you may or may not understand. Who knows how good a job I did? I don't know. But I want to tell you about Jesus. The reason I do these things is because I want you to know about Jesus. So if you don't know him, come ask me about him. I will tell you about him. Maybe you want help doing the things that were on the screen. Maybe you're like, Jim, I'm struggling with this. Or maybe you just need some prayer. I'll be here. Come talk to me. Ask me. I'm happy to pray with you. I'll be happy to talk to you. If you want join together we can study these things just come talk to me and ask me or if you just have something that you need to pray about this morning just you can come up to the front pray while we're singing 
or grab one of us to pray with you afterwards, me, Dan, the deacons. We'd be happy to pray with you. But just understand that it needs to be all about Christ. It needs to be about us honoring him. And as we honor our fathers today, our earthly fathers, we need to also honor our heavenly father. And so that, that's sort of the reason I called it the, the sermon, Who's Your Daddy? It's because we need to remember our heavenly father in all the things we do. Pray with me this morning. And Father, we come before you this morning. We just thank you.